Let us not toil unto our own good, but give us righteousness and faithful work. Remove the mess within us, restore your wisdom to us, that none be driven into deep despair. Consider God the works of God. Return the joy to us in all our toil. May our work be your delight. Return the joy to us in all our toil. Let our days be made. discontent and selfish pride. Now make our prayers humble and keep our conscience able for God's commandments will our work renew. Consider God the works of God. Return the joy to us in Lord, call 
us and send us, we will obey. Rescue the sinner, we'll put right the world. Help us to follow Jesus. us online. Uh, we gather together to worship our Lord in spirit and in truth. Uh, it's, it's good to see your faces this morning. It's good to see some of you who I, we haven't seen for a while. Um, it's good to gather together and to tell one another and also to rehearse together the story of God's grace for us, the God who calls us to himself and who forgives us our sins and who instructs us in his way and feeds us at his table. I just want to read to you this short quote. Um, by Harold Godard. The destiny of the world is determined, he said, by the stories it loves and believes in. We are recounting the great story of God's grace this morning in our worship. I want to invite you first, um, before we hear the call to worship, to listen to this song, The Love of God. We're going to sing it together later in our service, but first we want to just play it for you and let it uh, soak in, listen, and then we'll lift our voices singing this song later on in the service.
please stand and let's call one another to worship using Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has, he has founded, founded it upon, upon the seas and established it upon the river. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation.
Brothers and sisters, alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has given us new life and hope. He has raised Jesus from the dead. God has claimed us as his own. He has brought us out of darkness. He has made us light to the world. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let's go to our great God, now confessing our sins. He conquered death. He went to the cross for us, and he went through the cross and through the grave, conquering Satan, sin, and death for us. And so let's go to him, confessing that we are accomplice, accomplices in his death, but we also have life in his resurrection. Let's confess first using this confession hymn, then we'll have a time of silence, then we'll confess together. Confessing together now. Almighty God, you have raised Jesus from the grave and crowned him Lord of all. We confess that we have not bowed before him or acknowledged his rule in our lives. We have gone along with the way of the world and failed to give him glory. Forgive us and raise us from sin that we may be your faithful people. Obeying, obeying the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ, who rules the world and is head of the church, his body. Amen. Brothers and sisters, listen to these wonderful words of forgiveness and peace. They are for you this morning if you're uh, hiding in Jesus, resting in his righteousness alone for your salvation. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, because of the perfect work of Jesus on the cross for you, because he conquered death in his resurrection, I can declare to you that in Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thanks be to God indeed. Uh, now let's take a moment and pass the peace of Christ. I would uh, remind you again of the world that we live in. And so just stay in your cordoned off little area and maybe wave the peace of Christ to one another. Peace the Lord be with you. And also with you. Thank you. Be with you.
Sing with us. Do you feel the world is broken? Do you feel the shadows deepen? But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? Do you wish that you could see it?
that we're here together, aren't we? Isn't this wonderful? We see Elaine here up front. We're so proud of your fight. His mercy is more.
Amen. Our great God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, of what truths we sing, that we could never recount how great your love is. Words could never express fully how great it is. Our songs, though we sing (laughs) with gladdened hearts because of Easter morning, can never sing how wonderful your love is, the great extent, how it touches all things. Jesus, we love you. Father, we love you. Spirit, we love you. We adore you. We worship you. We praise you. Lord, these are not... uh, the words that fully express your love, but they are what we come to this morning with. And we come because of your perfect work on the cross and resurrection, Jesus. We receive our worship, where we offer it in your powerful name. Amen. I want to mention a couple things this morning, just sort of by way of uh, announcement. Um, This is coming a little late. I've emailed with some of you, but we're going to do an intro to Second City class this coming Saturday. Uh, This is one of the classes. This is is the class that we ask people to attend if they would consider being members of the church. And so that's going to be from 830 to noon in the social hall. We'll provide refreshments and we'll be around a big, big table so we can distance while still fellowshipping and uh, learning together. So that's going to be this Saturday. If you're interested, if you're watching and you're interested, please email me or Cindy in the office. Um, that's going to be this coming Saturday. Another thing I wanted to mention is uh, during this time is I know many of you uh, might not know or have ever even met some of our older shut-ins. Um, but one of them, uh, Gloria Fox, she's had Alzheimer's uh, for many years now. I don't know that she actually has ever worshipped since the two churches have merged. She's been in care facilities. Um, she na- now lives over off of Trindle in a care facility there. Um, But she, this is just part of the legacy of our church, and I just wanted to share this with you. Tomorrow, uh, April 12th, will mark the 85th anniversary of when she became a member of this church. And I um, I just wanted to share that with you as uh, a way of encouragement, that there is a legacy of people. I mean, the, the church, you know, spans millennia and that, that's a great encouragement, but it's also a great encouragement I, for me to know that there are people within our own body that have followed Jesus for a long life, um, even in their suffering in their old age. And so a, as you uh, pray, as you are with the Lord this week, maybe thank him especially for people like Gloria Fox and others who have long lived in faithfulness to Jesus. Uh, let me pray now uh, for our children. Um, we're not dismissing them as we did pre-COVID, but let me pray for them that God would bless them. Lord Jesus, we, uh, certainly as parents and as people who have made vows to our children in their baptisms and uh, vowed to care for one another as we raise our children in your ways, Lord Jesus, we take comfort knowing that you welcomed children, um, that you even gave uh, stern warnings against those who would hinder them from coming to you or would do anything to prohibit them from coming to you. Uh, Lord, so we know that it is your great desire uh, to care for and to love our children. And we pray, Lord, that they would know that now, that they would know intimately the the love of God that reaches far, that's greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. God, I pray that they would know the love of God for them. And I pray that you would be with us as we seek to care for them, even in this strange time, that you would bless the Zoom meetings that happen online, children in worship in that avenue, and draw near to parents in this um, time when children are home more than normal and uh, the challenges of our our year, our time that seems so uh, spread out, spread thin. God, encourage parents and give them wisdom and knowledge and how to raise their children this time. God, bless the children of this church. We pray, God, I pray 
that those who are raised here would be raised uh, with your knowledge and with your love that penetrates them so much that 85 years, 97 years would not seem like a long time to follow you, but that they would joyfully do that. God, I am thankful that you've given us examples like Gloria Fox, like our dear sister Elaine Zubrod, who's uh, filling our hearts with her presence here with us and who is faithfully following you through the suffering of her cancer, Lord. God, thank you for these pictures of faithfulness to the end. Pray that our children would rise up like these women and that they would bless you all of their days. Pray this in your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Now, uh, please give attention to the reading of God's word. We're going to hear first from Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There's no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the ends, end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them. And there's nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Would you stand and we'll sing the glory of Patri together? Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, Today's New Testament reading is from the book of Galatians, chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way also, we were children. We were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come... God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. For the Lord. Let's sing together this gospel acclamation. Alleluia.
I'm going to read for us from the Gospel of John, but I'm going to read a little bit more than what you have printed for you in your bulletin. I'm going to start at verse 11. So hear now the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped in, uh, stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said that these things to her. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Lord Jesus, um, we do pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations and the thoughts and the desires of all of our hearts would be pleasing to you. Uh, Lord, we pray this Easter tide as we think of resurrection, of life after death, that you would instruct us in the way of life together, community life together, a life lived with one another in light of these things. God, instruct us in your ways. Shape us into your life, we pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so um, community life after COVID. It seems to be something that's stirring, particularly with more and more uh, people being vaccinated and sort of life in some ways returning in some places. And I think the question that a lot of people have is, well, what's that going to be like? What's it going to be like? Um, one article that I read pointed out that non-communicable diseases like uh, diabetes or hypertension, though they are often related to sort of how somebody lives, individuals' lifestyle choices, they are often actually related also to things like economic dynamics and social factors, social factors, social activities. And what this was suggesting is that how we live within community with others or without others affects our well-being. Our, our body's health is actually changed and shaped by our engagement with others and how that happens or doesn't happen. So how do we live with others? And how do we live with one another? Um, I imagine many of you are wondering uh, what it'll be like to sort of go back to work after spending so much time on a screen, go back to work in person. Um, many of us are wondering what our city in some ways is going to be like if we're going to have prolonged times of state employees still working online. Or there's, I mean, talking to some of my neighbors, it may be a very long time or it may not be that they come back fully in person. And how will that affect life in our city that depends so much on people coming and eating and shopping and these kinds of things, doing some of their life in the city. What will be the effects of this past year on this place, on these people? 
Um, this past week, Melissa and I were talking to a, a couple of you, and we were wondering aloud how long we will be wearing masks. Uh, will it be sort of like 9-11, where it just sort of has its ripple effect in some ways indefinitely? Um, there's questions that are surrounding this time. How will children's friendships be after sort of minimal engagement? How will students be affected uh, of a year of online learning? I was listening to a, a podcast this last week about parenting, and the counselor that was being interviewed said, questions that surround screen time have just sort of been dropped <laughs> because there's so much screen time now. It's just reshaping our minds and how we engage with others. Okay, so of course, I think one of the big questions, and not just for me, but I imagine for you all, I hope you guys are asking this, is what does our community life look like as a church? What is, how's the church shaped in all of this? How did this year change Second City Church? What will it look like for us to re-engage, hopefully in healthier and fuller ways with one another and the world about us? What will it look, look like, like for us to be together again? Whether it's how we instruct our children in the way of Jesus, how we love our neighbors by the commands of Jesus, how we support our missionaries, how we care for one another in the context of things like our benevolence team or our community groups. How do we do our life together? How do we care for our internal community and our community at large as Jesus calls us to? How do we understand what it means to be the community of Jesus? Okay, so as all these questions are sort of surrounding us, I want us in this Easter tide, this time between Easter and Pentecost, to sort of sit with the idea of, that we are to be this resurrection community, right? We are a people that are shaped by the belief that Jesus rose from the dead. And that actually has an effect on our life together. We're the community of the resurrection community that knows the weight of sin, the cost of sin, the effects of it, the brokenness of our bodies and our relationships and our world, but we also know the power of God. The death doesn't have the final say, but the tomb was empty. And so in some ways, I want to invite us all to sort of begin to think together of what does it mean to move out of the darkness of this year, sort of a prolonged Holy Saturday that just sort of sits in death and waiting. And we want to hear again what it means to be the community of Jesus, the community of the resurrected one, his body, the church. So I read these two narratives for you, these two resurrection narratives. First, Mary at the tomb, uh, seeking Jesus and being found by Jesus. Being told by him of all things not to cling to him, but to go out and to tell and then the second one is the disciples. They're together, uh, they're together there, and the door's locked, and it says they're fearful. Um, they hear the words of Jesus spoken over them, words of peace. But then almost immediately, they also are sent out. They're sent. And what I want to suggest to you is that there's something key to understanding our identity as a community in this. One of the things that marks resurrection community that we see in these narratives is that it is a community that is sent. It's a community that's on mission. The community of Jesus, the church, is a sent community. It's an apostolic community, the sent ones. And I think our text here uh, tells us a few key things about this, okay? This is the first key thing to our identity as a sent community. And that is that we do not exist as a holy huddle. Okay, y'all probably heard that phrase, a holy huddle. Um, but one of the neat things about this passage is I want to suggest to you that this passage, these two narratives together, teach us that you can't exist as a holy huddle as an individual or as a community, okay? Think about Mary. Uh, I, preached, I preached the passage uh, here of Mary last Easter, uh, but I preached primarily around this question that uh, is asked of her, Mary, why do you weep? Why do you weep? But one of the things that's always really, really stood out to me in this narrative is, is that Jesus says to her right after that, right after she recognizes him, he says, 
don't cling to me. Don't cling to me. I mean, if I had just recognized my friend, my Lord, my master, my rabbi, the one who was my great teacher, and I recognized him after just a couple days earlier witnessing that he was nailed upon the cross, and actually, like I mentioned last week, she watched as he was brought to the tomb. It said in Matthew that he was standing at a distance, or they were up across the tomb from a distance watching. And there is Jesus right in front of you now in the empty tomb. The most natural thing to do ever would just be to cling to him, right? Jesus, don't leave me again. Don't leave me, Jesus. He's there right with you. Can you imagine it? Okay, so one of the common things I think that can happen if you've personally been changed by Jesus, if you know the resurrection and the cross are for you, that he speaks your name and calls you to himself. One of the things that we can be tempted to do is to believe that life with Jesus is primarily me and Jesus. It's just a small, small holy huddle of Jesus and me. And that can kind of be it. A spiritual life is a life about me and Jesus. It's not a life that pertains to other people, that influences how I exist with other people. There's a temptation to think that the church, for many, is not necessary. Take it or leave it kind of thing. Take or leave the idea that my life with Jesus affects how I work and how I parent and how I engage in the world about me. It's just Jesus and me. There's a temptation to think that sharing our faith with those who don't believe in Jesus just simply isn't necessary. Spiritual life is my spiritual life. And I got this little holy huddle with Jesus. Jesus is just you and me. Jesus comforts me. He speaks to my sadness. And Jesus just hold on right here to me. But Jesus doesn't want us to just exist as individuals with him in this small holy huddle. This is a warning, actually, I think, to think that the community of Jesus is primarily me and Jesus. Um, I think this is a good warning for us right now. It's an important warning for our time. I will say this. Uh, I am so, so grateful, primarily for how much time and energy Tim Cope has put in to allowing us to have our worship services online. I mean, for you who are with us online, I am so glad you're with us online. But one of the habits that may have been formed through this year is you can sort of do the Christian walk on your couch. Maybe, maybe with your family, but maybe just you. And you sort of feel like, hey, spiritually, I kind of got by this year. Maybe I can have a really, really small holy huddle of me and Jesus, or just me and my family and Jesus, and sort of take and consume online or something. And this is challenging that. This is challenging that. Life with Jesus cannot exist just you and Jesus. So there's a warning against the individual holy huddle, but then there's also this warning against the sort of corporate holy huddle. Um, Mary clings to Jesus after he meets her in her weeping. And the disciples are all together. And we read that the door is locked. And the door is locked because they're full of fear. He speaks his peace. He shows them his hands and his side. And their fear turns to joy. It's, the text said that they were really glad. Um, which in some ways you'd think, of course, there is their friend again with them. A death didn't hold him back. But now, again, immediately, Jesus says, you guys got to get out of here. <laughs> Unlock that door. Go out. Or what he says is, as the Father sent me, so I send you. He says, you can't just huddle up here together. Get out. Just as there are many temptations to think, that your life with Jesus can exist on just an individual level, individual salvation kind of thing, there is a real temptation within Christian community for those communities to become holy huddles. There is a real temptation for churches to think that all they need to do is build the community within the church. So our building only exists for us, our money only exists for us, our time exists for us, 
And I want to suggest to you that partly we do do this out of fear. I mean, it is sort of a fearful thing, quite frankly, to think of how uh, our own sort of heating system has been taxed because we've got a school <laughs> that uses it all the time now. And we've got loaves of love down below. And there are these things that actually could create real fear. How are we going to do this? How much money are we giving away? Will we exist in a little while? It can be out of fear. But, you know, holy huddles can actually also be out of love. Uh, as I was contemplating this passage this week, it just struck me how beautiful in a way it is that the disciples are actually together. I mean, think about it. Um, over those three years, they'd probably become really close friends together. Their friendship had developed and their care for one another had grown in that time. But then this grief hit them that was so heavy. Their Lord was taken away and hung on a cross and died. Their hopes for their own lives, for the life of their friends, for the life of the world seemed to have been crucified and died on a cross. And their grief would have been absolutely intense. And even in the midst of that grief, they come together. There's something actually very lovely and very beautiful about the love that they express for one another. So though holy huddles of groups can happen partly out of fear, they can also happen for very good reasons, out of love, out of mutual care, of walking through difficulty together, of actually living part of the true Christian life together, entering into one another's sorrow. When their fear seemed to overwhelm them, they didn't go to a fearful place alone, but they entered into it as a community. There's something beautiful about this. Nearly all of my closest friends in my life, I will say this, have come out of Christian communities, the community of the church or the community of a school that I attended or um, campus ministries that I was involved with. Most of my deepest and closest relationships have come out of Christian communities. But sometimes what comes out of that good thing is the desire to just hold it so closely, not let any new people in, not be influenced by other people's thoughts about such ministry, how this thing might change. We kind of have an idea of this influenced me so much and so intensely, and I receive love so well that, man, don't mess with this one bit. This is just how I need it. New ideas are poo-pooed. New gifts are not celebrated. What I'm suggesting to you is the first key to understanding a resurrection community of mission, community on mission, is a warning against a holy huddle. Okay, so the second thing, the second key to understanding this community, this resurrection community as being a community on mission, is that we must first be recipients before we can be givers. We must first be recipients before we can be givers. So after telling Mary not to cling to him, Jesus tells her to go to those fearful disciples, those Deserters, those deniers, those guys that followed me around all the time only to leave at my darkest hour. But he actually didn't say that, did he? Did you notice that? I, mean, I think this is actually absolutely amazing. They had seen him do wonderful things like give sight to the blind and declare the forgiveness of God to sinners. They had seen him do miraculous things. And then when people are, you know, with spears taking him away, after he could do such remarkable things as raise Lazarus from the dead, they all dis desert him. I mean, maybe he would say, hey, go tell those people that are l lacking in faith that they need to grow up. Come check it out. I rose from the dead. But that's, that's not what he said. Instead, he says, go tell my brothers. Go tell my brothers. It's as though the first thing that he wants to know, the resurrection community to know, is his grace. They need to first be recipients of it. Before they can do anything else, they need to be recipients of it. Jesus, in the upper room, in John chapter 15, had remarkably called his disciples his friends. They weren't just those who were instructed by him, but they were close. They were friends. And that was an incredible statement. That was an incredible statement. He 
as their friend. But here, and this is the first time in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, my brothers. My brothers. In this, Jesus is giving them an int- this intimate act of affection. He's adopting them. He's saying, your family. You're not simply companions in the journey. You're not even just friends, as wonderful as that is. But he says, in my resurrection, what I want to tell you is that you are my family. You are my brothers. My family. He says, further, he says, tell them that as I am ascending to my father and to your father, to my God and to your God. He reinforces this again. The one who made all things is your brother. His father, God in heaven, is your father. You're not just deserters. You're not just you of little faith, but you are part of the family of God. My grace is for you. If Mary is to go out to be sent on mission, she first needs to hear and to receive Jesus' comfort in the midst of sadness and sin's effects. Her sorrow over the brokenness of the world Jesus speaks into. He calls her by name first before he sends her out. He says that they are brothers before he sends them out. He gives them his peace before they become his missionaries. We have to be recipients first before we can be givers. We cannot go out with the mission of Jesus if we have not first received the grace of Jesus. We cannot go out into the world that is full of pain and sorrow. If we do not know pain and sorrow ourselves and know the grace and peace of God that has been brought to us, Jesus enters in and deals with Satan, sin, and death for us. And we have to know and experience that before we can actually be those who are sent to proclaim it and to live it. We cannot go out and declare the forgiveness of sins if we do not know first ourselves to be sinners who have received his grace. Here's what I'm suggesting. You simply cannot give what you don't have. You can't give what you don't have. All right. Finally, the third key to understanding the resurrection community as a community of mission is that we must understand that it is not our mission, but it is the mission of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, In these two narratives together, we have the Father, Son, and Spirit working and named. Jesus is going back to the Father who sent him. Out of love, God the Father gave his only Son that whoever believes in him would have eternal life. Out of love, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Out of love, Jesus gives the spirit, the Lord, and the giver of life. I think the thing that stood out to me the most in this narrative, this post-resurrection narrative of Jesus with the disciples who were full of fear and who he spoke peace over and gave gladness to, was that when he sent them out, he said this, If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Then you just like kind of cock your head when you, you, what? Like my dog growing up when I'd say, hey, Pappy, and she'd always go, huh? What? What's going on there? I can't forgive the sins of others. God alone can do that. Right. (laughs) Most commentators that I read said this. That's the point. That's the point. The gift of the Spirit here is not so they can have some special spiritual experience, and it's not so that they can be some holier-than-thou club. Look, we've got the Spirit. Now, the gift of the Spirit is so that the community of Jesus might be continued in the presence, might continue the presence of Jesus in the world. That the community of Jesus might actually continue the presence of Jesus in the world. As the Father sent me, he says, so I send you. Right? So our mission is not about us. It is absolutely about the work of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit together. Our ministry, our identity as the sent ones, the apostolic community, begins with our knowing that we are not just a, comp- a companion of friends, but we are children of God. And just like Jesus, we are the ones who are led by the Spirit. Think of Jesus being baptized in the Jordan. 
at the very, very beginning of his ministry, the very beginning of his ministry begins with the Father speaking over him, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased, and the Spirit descending. And as Jesus has this little community that he is sending out, he is giving them this same identity as those who belong to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, so what kind of community will we be? What kind of community do we need to be as a church? What will it look like for us to be this community in the coming months and years? What will mark our life together? What I'm suggesting to you is that if we are to be these people that believe that the tomb was empty, that the cross did not have the final say, then we must be the people of God sent on the mission of God. I pray that we will be marked by being a community on mission. More than that, I pray that we will be a community that has been with Jesus. And because we've been with Jesus, we are marked by his presence in the world. We become like the God who is on mission, a God who sends his son, a son who goes with the obedience of the Father to the cross, a spirit who converts and brings people to new life. When you've been with the son, you have the marks of the son. This is a rather silly example that I'll end with. It's been sunny recently. And uh, one of the things that I noticed quite a bit in the last week is as I spent some time outside is that I couldn't help but notice that the sun affected me. Let me demonstrate for you. Do you see those white marks, right? I can't like help but say, I was with the sun. And that's what I long for for us to be. People that can't help but as they go about in their daily life for people to say, oh, they were with Jesus. Oh, they were with the Father. Oh, they were with the Spirit. And so it's just as we go about our life that we will be people on the mission of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have Jesus calling us to this. We have him blessing us as those who are brothers and sisters, who have God as their Father. And we are those who are indwelt with the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, this is God's call to us. His grace is sufficient for us, and he will lead us in it. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, think of how full of sorrow Mary was, weeping. But how you revived her in the resurrection. Lord Jesus, we think of how fearful the disciples were. You had hung on a cross. Their Lord had been taken from them. But how you gave them gladness and joy. God, I pray that we who know the sorrow of living in a world that is so infected with sin, that we so often are perpetrators of, God, we who know this sorrow and we who often live in this fear, God, I pray that you would move in us and shape us, that you would speak your words of comfort and peace, and that out of that, you would send us out. Send us out, Lord. Shape us to be people on your great mission, that many might come to the saving knowledge of you, Lord Jesus, you who died and rose again. Work in and through us that we might be a resurrection community, proclaiming life into the death of this world. We pray this in your powerful name. Amen. Would you stand and we will recite the creed together? Brothers and sisters, in whom do you believe? I believe, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. O Christ, born of the Father before all ages, you took upon yourself our humanity, and you rose for us. We worship you. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. Son of God, source of life, we invoke your goodness upon us and upon the entire human family. Hear us, Lord Lord, Lord of glory. glory. Allow us to live by your life and to walk as children of light in the joy of Easter. Hear Hear us, us, Lord Lord of glory. Increase the faith of your church. May it faithfully bear witness to your resurrection. Hear Hear us, us, Lord Lord of glory. Lord, comfort all who are burdened and engrave in their hearts your words of eternal life. Hear Hear us, us, Lord Lord of of glory. glory. Strengthen those who are weak in faith and reveal yourself to doubting hearts. God, we pray especially for Yeah, we bring before you uh, Jenny Anderson with her heart surgery on Monday and uh, her recovery. God, we pray that you'd strengthen her. God, we do also pray for Anna Camp, especially this past week as she uh, moved into homeland. God, um, pray for Ed that you'd be his comfort. Draw near to them, Lord. Hear us, Lord of glory. Give strength to the sick, support the elderly, and reassure the dying of your saving presence. Hear us, us, Lord Lord of of glory. glory. Amen. Amen. Let me pray for our tithes and offerings. Lord Jesus, we bless you and we praise you that you gave of yourself completely. You died that we might live. You who were once rich became poor, that we, through your poverty, might become rich. Jesus, we pray that as you gave everything for us, Lord, we would give everything to you. And God, we pray that you would receive our tithes and offerings as pictures of this devotion to you. And that you would bless them, Lord, for the furtherance of your kingdom in this world, for your mission in this world. God, we pray that we would not be stingy, but we would be free, giving gladly, because you have given all for us. Lord, bless the tithes and offerings of this church, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing the doxology together. Praise Praise God God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here. come to the table of the Lord and here we celebrate here we celebrate the gift of God for us that Jesus went to the cross for us he took our sins upon himself on the cross and he conquered them in the resurrection I said last week it bears repeating that we would not have this Eucharistic meal this meal of Thanksgiving if Jesus hadn't arisen from the dead but he did and so this meal is a Thanksgiving meal that God has done what none of us could do He paid the penalty perfectly for our sins on the cross, and he rose again that we might have new life in him. 
So if you know that to be true of you, if you've been baptized and belong to the body of Christ, his church, then I'd encourage you, take and eat, take and drink, be nourished in your faith. If, if you don't know Jesus, maybe you're just checking out this whole church thing, then uh, as the elements are distributed, maybe let them pass you by, let them pass you by, and consider this good news, what Jesus has done on the cross and resurrection. Brothers and sisters, alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is, he is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right for us to give thanks and praise. It is good and it is right to give you thanks and praise at all times and in all places for your mercy endures forever. You are holy, O Lord, God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, whom you sent to save us. He came with healing in his touch and was wounded for our sins. He came with mercy in his voice and was mocked as one despised. He came with peace in his heart and met with violence and death. By your power, he broke free from the prison of the tomb, and at his, at his command, the gates of hell were opened. The one who was dead now lives. The one who humbled himself is raised to rule over all creation. The lamb upon the throne, the one ascended on high, is with us always, as he promised. Therefore, we join our voices with all the saints and angels and the whole in creation to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth, of hell, of your glory, chosen in the which he was betrayed that he took bread and having blessed it he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said take eat this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me and after the supper the lord took the cup and said this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins the apostle paul adds that it is as often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup that we proclaim the lord's death until he comes again let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Let's first say what we normally say, Christ has risen, Christ has died, Christ will come again. And then let's sing this alleluia again. Christ has risen, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ, Christ, risen. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. Let's say that again, okay? Christ, Christ has died, died. Christ, Christ has risen, risen. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. Let's sing. Alleluia. Jesus, we, we long, Lord, for you to come and complete your mission of making all things new, bringing your glory to bear on all things. But Jesus, we also bless you and we worship you for long ago giving the gift of your spirit to your church, the Lord and the giver of life who leads us in your way. Spirit, we bless you and we praise you. Spirit, we do pray that you would give us faith, even now as we come to this table, that in receiving this bread and this wine, it might be for us the body and blood of Christ, and that we might be the body of Christ, his presence in this world, 
continuing his mission in this place, the places that he calls us to. We pray this in Jesus' powerful name and pray as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Our Father, Father, who art art in heaven, heaven, hallowed hallowed be thy name. name. Thy Thy kingdom kingdom come, thy thy will be done, on on earth earth as as it is is in heaven. heaven. Give Give us this this day day our daily bread, bread, and forgive forgive us our our debts, as we forgive our our debtors. debtors. Lead Lead us us not into temptation, temptation, but but deliver us from from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the the glory, glory forever and and ever. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him by faith with thanksgiving. I'm going to distribute these elements, and again, I would ask that you hold on to them, and that after they've all been distributed, then we would partake together.
brothers and sisters, our, Lord, uh, our Lord's body was broken for us that we might have life in him. Let's take and eat together. Jesus' blood was shed for us that our sins would be washed away. Let's take and drink. Lord Jesus, we bless you and we praise you. Lord, we thank you that you have given us life, that through your death and resurrection, we who were once dead in sin are now alive because of Christ, because of you. Lord, the death that we see all around us, that at times can seem so overwhelming, that can cause us to just lock ourselves in out of fear. God, it's not too much for you. God, I pray that you would send us out now with the power of your spirit to be your hands and to be your feet, to find it our greatest joy to walk in the way of Jesus, to be the people of God together on the mission of God sent by the power of the Holy Spirit. God, do this in us. Shape us to be a community of deep love for one another and of deep love for your world. For God, you so love the world that you gave. Would we walk in your ways even this week? We pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand and receive this benediction. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. 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 You send your servant forth in peace according to your word. For my eyes, my eyes have seen the salvation of the Lord. You send your servant forth According to your word For my eyes, my eyes have seen The salvation of the Lord My eyes have seen your salvation Which you have prepared
salvation, a light for revelation to all people for Israel's glory. You send your servant forth in peace according to your word. For my eyes, my eyes have seen the salvation. Send your son.